special for the kiddos next door. And there she read your Bibles, please, the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew, chapter 13. And we continue on, Jesus has started to transition here and using parables. We looked at a few of those last couple weeks. And a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, right? It's trying to speak a truth in a very, and I think, a very visual way. And so he's using word pictures of common things that they would have totally understood at this time. And so Jesus goes through here, like I said, he, he's in teaching, and now we're going to get into like two really short ones, which basically drive home the same kind of theme. In Matthew chapter 13, uh, starting at verse 31 and 32, it says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his garden, which is indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, and becomes a tree, so the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, as we look at these parables, you guys take the big picture. Uh, sometimes people uh, find fault that they sort of take these parables and kind of go through them with a fine-tooth tome. And you can get to a whole sort of mess, because that's not the purpose of the parable. The, the parable is a big picture. And over the years, I've heard people say, well, mustard seed isn't the smallest seed. Well, it's a tiny little seed. And uh, you say, well, a strawberry seed is even smaller. All right. And then on the other side of things, Jesus says, look, it becomes a great tree. And you're like, well, you know, even the most grandest scheme is uh, the plant that you talk about, which probably grew only about 10 feet tall. There are trees that are bigger than that. And they try to use this kind of the poo-poo what the point is. And it's like, listen, the idea what Jesus is behind your cross is something small becomes something big. That's what he's trying to get here. And this is a real powerful thing we start about the kingdom of God. We, we live in a society that's so driven for success. You know, you're only successful if you know, make lots of money, right? How much money? Well, more. We're only successful if we talk about churches. And, you know, how, how many people will come? How much money is given? How much properties do you have? How many campuses? Oh, we look at all these grand things. And Jesus brings us back and says, look, it's, it's about the small things. It's about the small things. And we talk about the idea of the mustard seed. The first part of this parable talks about this tiny little mustard seed. And really the size of it. We've got to realize that when God calls us, most of us aren't going to do big things. We're not big people. And I'm not talking about, you know, after potluck and you wear your stretchy pants, you know. And I'm talking about that kind of big. But in here, right, in the, in the scheme of things, we, we were driven of, of saying, look, we got to be so successful, and here's the world's idea of success. That sometimes we feel like, what difference can I make? I'm just the little thing. And Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It starts small. But see, you got to realize that God chooses the small, to show that he is great. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says this, And God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Right? The foolish things. That, that's me. My wife would tell you. Right? The goofy things. The insignificant things. Why God would choose to use me, I don't know. So if you get anything good out of this, it's not me, it's God. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. Because he lets you hear what you need to hear. I remember years ago, I was, you know, was working in drive through McDonald's, you know, teenager, so a little time ago. And uh, a lady came to the drive through and she goes, Oh, you got a good voice, you should do radio. And I was like, oh, so I got kind of puffed up, I went home. And I was like, Mom! Yeah, he said that I should be on radio. She goes, she goes, I always thought you really had a really scratchy voice. I was like, thanks, Mom. You know? But we turn around, and, and God uses the foolish things, the simple things in this life to show that the power is of God and not us. You know, a couple of years ago, 
I was uh, a group of guys from the church who were, were going to go play golf. And I always kind of resisted golf. Uh, my first church, there's a bunch of guys in the church, businessmen, who uh, kind of played golf. And they're like, Pastor, you come out and play golf. And I was like, you know, that's the, sort of the cliche, sort of pretentious, the pastor goes play golf. So I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, plus it cost, you know, more money than I had at the time to, to do that. Well, the second church, we up in Enfield, there was a small little golf course. I don't know if it's still up there. And basically what someone did was they took a field and just put holes in it. So you can hit it way out of whack, and you, you can find your ball. because It's just like one giant field mode. It was like great. It wasn't any hazards. There was nothing like that. And a bunch of us went out golfing, and we were just like Yahoo golf. I mean, one guy ran around. He had a, he had a, a putter. He had a, a driver and one iron, and he ran around like this. You know, but it was the most fun we had. And so I was like, oh, I need a golf club. And, and so I started talking to people about golf. Like, what kind of golf club do I need? And the guy says, listen. You know, you know what you're doing. He goes, you can go out and buy a cheap set of clubs and be okay. I got to be careful. Ken's here. He's a, a golf star. So correct me. I'm, I'm, I'm going, Zach, I'm going into sports illustrations here. But uh, he goes, look, you're, any club you buy is better than you. So don't worry about it. Buy, you know. And I was like, okay. He goes, you know, you can give Tiger Woods a plunger and he'd play better than you. Right? The skill is in the person and not the, and not the equipment. And I often feel like that's how we are with God, that we are small and we are foolish and we are weak. You know, we like to put on that we're tough when we have it all together. But so many of us are just kind of broken inside by the things of life. And we look at the Bible and we see, or we at least perceive, all these Bible characters are the heroes of the faith. And look how strong they were. You know what? They were weak and foolish, and God used them. It's the small things, the weak things, that God uses in our lives. And I'm so thankful for that. The foolish things of this world. And why? To put to shame the wise. And John says this, And then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude come towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this is the feeding of the 5,000. We have this great multitude that gather up. It was getting late in the day. And Jesus turns around and says, hey, Philip, you feed them. And Philip's like, what do I got? And so they went out, and I find it interesting. They said, there was a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Now here they went out and scattered around and see if they could find, either get some money for donations or whether they can go out and find enough food. How are we going to feed everyone? You know, we got potluck. We're not going to have that problem. There's plenty of food over there. And, uh, but all, they, all that, they found out one little boy. He's got five pieces of bread and two fish. And what are we going to do with this? And the Bible says God blessed it. Jesus blessed it and became more than enough. See, God uses the small. A little boy, you know, oftentimes we kind of blow off these kids and like, oh, what can a guy do? I'm too young. Or maybe you think I'm too old or maybe you think I'm not smart enough or maybe you think I've passed by or maybe you think you have so much in your past and maybe you have guilt and maybe you have shame maybe you made mistakes all these things and what can God do with it? or what I can do is seems insignificant I can only give just a little bit of my money maybe a little bit of my time what can God do with the little I have? Let me tell you something. If God blesses it and we put it in his hands, he can do great things. It's not about us. It's about what God can do. But our willingness. I'm thankful that God uses the small things. I don't have to be grand. You know, years ago, I, I gave up going to the pastor's fellowship. I, I, I'm involved in one now. I really like a good group of guys. But so many times we go to other pastor groups and and sometimes 
pastors can be a little egotistical. You know, you go there and they'll be like, well, you know, we had 400 people in the church, or we had this many, you know, we had this, and, and oh, we had this much money. And all of a sudden they're all like, kind of thumping their chest. Have you ever been around people like that way? Right? And it's like, I'm like, I don't have time for that. I don't want to play that game. Lord, help me be faithful in what I can do and who you bring my path, Lord. You know, I shared with you guys, I think, before that we were in Bible school and I was doing an a, a interim pastor at a church. And one of the deacons invited us out and there was a, a Christian business group. And so we went to this place, and it was after, it was after I think it was the evening service, and they were like, oh, come on out. And it's like, we're just going out for ice cream. And we're in Bible school. We're, we're flat broke. We had, we had nothing. And, uh, and so I looked at it, and I was like, well, you know, we had, I don't know about you, we keep a little cup of change in the car. And uh, so we went out there, and we said, okay, you know, I think we got enough to get an ice cream, so we're going to get an ice cream and probably split it. And so we go to this place, and it was kind of ritzy. And so we went inside, and we sat down, and there was probably about six other couples, and they were all dressed to the nines, you know? And so the menu comes out, we look on there, and there's no prices on the menu. That's not a good sign. If you're broke, that's not a good sign. And uh, so we, both, we got water, and they got, you know, drinks, and, and so I said, well, we'll get just a, a scoop of vanilla ice cream to split, and they all got meals, they got, I mean... And this one lady looked across from us and, and started asking questions. And she asked what I drove. And I told her, she goes, oh, that's an old car. And she, you know, you ever been in a position where someone made you feel small? You ever been there? And the way she was just talking about us was just belittling of, you know, I don't know how you poor people do it. And stuff like that. It was just this, and I'm like, this is supposed to be a Christian business group, right? I mean, they're like, and so, and... Finally, the end of the meal came, and, and they're all like, you know what, I'll pay this time. No, 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 I'll pay. No, 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 I'll pay. And so they're all kind of playing that game, and uh, the lady across from me looked at me, she's like, I said, I ain't paying. <laughs> and she kind of looked at me, and I kind of had enough, right? And uh, I said, I'm not paying. And someone else paid the bill, and we didn't have to. So I still I have no idea how much that scoop up in the ice cream was. I was getting nervous. And... Uh, but we left, and to this day, I mean, we're talking, this is 30 years ago. And I still remember what it felt like having someone make you feel like you're nothing. And this is with other Christians. And yet when you come to Christ, like this little boy says, this is all I got. And Jesus says, it's enough. The kingdom of God is like that. It starts with the small. It starts with the weak. It starts with the foolish. It starts with those saying, I have nothing. And Jesus says, all you got to do is come. It's not about the grand. It's about the small. Jesus says this in Matthew. He says, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in my name, of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The scriptures are full of those who come up. I was just reading this week about Gideon, and the Lord called him to help deliver him out of the hand of the Israel out of the hands of the Midnights. And the angel says, Hey, you mighty man of valor, right? You brave hero. And he's like, You talking to me? He goes, don't you understand? I'm the least of my family and my tribe is the least of them all. What can I do? David, King David. When Samuel came to anoint the king, they ushered in all the other brothers. And God said, nope, 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 nope. And finally, he was like, is there anyone else? Well, pff, there's David. He's the runt of the litter. He, he's up in the field. You know, he's just... And God used him. God used 
backwoods fishermen to be his disciples. Matthew, who is a, a traitor who was working for the Romans, the least of these. We get so caught up in thinking all the big stuff and all we got to do, and yet sometimes we feel so insignificant, and God says, Come. He says, Even just giving a cold cup of water in my name can do so much. See, the kingdom of God starts in the small. Because Zechariah really wraps it up. It's not about us. It's not about how strong I am and how mighty I am, how, how, you know, how much money I have, what kind of family I come from. It has nothing to do with any of those things. Zechariah says this, And so he answered and said to them, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. See, it's not that you're strong, it's that he is. It's not that I have much, it's that he does. It's not that I'm wise, but he is. You know, sometimes churches get reps, you know, people are like, well, I can't go to church because I'm not good enough. Guess what? None of us are. It's not about that. And the worst thing that we can do is come and, and pretend we're okay. We can pretend we're strong and we're all right. I don't need nothing. When we're breaking inside, Lord, I need you. It's probably one of the best prayers that we can say, Lord, I can't do this. And I wonder sometimes, you know, God brings us all this and I try everything, I scheme everything, and finally I'm hanging on, like, you know, just by the end of the rope, just barely hanging on, and then I'm like, Lord, help. He's like, I wish you would have said that when the beginning. What, what took you so long? Because you should be glad you're not like me, because I'm stubborn. Sometimes I think, I got this. I can do it. And God's like, no, you can't. And he's like, well, how long does it take for me to wake up and say, God, I need you? Because it's not about being good enough. Because none of us are. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, right? None of us are good enough. But his grace is enough. His grace is sufficient for all our needs. And so the kingdom of God starts small in the small things. It started with a, a handful of disciples, of rejects, if you will, sort of a motley crew. And in this, it grew. We see this. The mustard seed started off small, but then it becomes this great tree. The word of God grows. And we see this growth in the two aspects. One is in the world. Right? We started with Jesus and, and 12 disciples, and now it's worldwide. It spread and touched so many lives. Jesus told us in the book of Acts before he goes, it goes, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this is kind of like that bullseye, right? We start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then everywhere. We see the word of God spreading. And through countries around the world, they've tried to suppress it. They've killed Christians. Throwing them in jail. And yet the church hasn't stopped. We live in a day and age where we are being suppressed. Now, I, I gotta be careful here because the persecution we are suffering now is nothing compared to some of what's going around the world. I, I don't want to make that comparison. I remember back when uh, the Iraq war was going on, I remember there were a bunch of Christians that were put into a cage. And they were drowned with cameras playing, and they live-streamed it. We're not facing anything like that. But Christian, do not be deceived. We are heading into persecution. We're heading to a point where our love for the Lord and our living by faith is going to be turned upon. We're going to be outcasts in this society, which, you know, I find it fascinating. Just go back not even ten years ago. We were the mainstream thought. This was a, a Judeo-Christian-based country that has turned, and now we're outcasts in society. You can have your faith, but don't talk about it. Right? You can have your faith, but don't go into the ballot box with it. 
And I know some of you have been ostracized, unfriended. And Christian, I, I think that's just going to escalate as you go forward. But you know what? That is, is not going to stop the church. It's not going to stop the church. It's going to go. And actually, historically, as the church has faced persecution, guess what? It has grown. As the world gets darker, we have an opportunity to shine brighter and point people in the way. Matthew says this, Jesus' words. So this is the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The gospel is going to go across the globe. People are coming to the Lord. Now, we're not seeing a whole lot of revival here in this country. I pray for it. If we look in other countries and people are getting saved, in Muslim countries, people are coming to the Lord. The church is not stopped, it grows. But also in the kingdom of God, we talk about this mustard seed, it also grows in us. One of the verses I've really been going through here, and uh, with the church I've been kind of using the tagline, ordinary people serving an extraordinary God. And this is the verse I get this from. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, and not destroyed. What he talks about here, we have this treasure, earthen vessel, in these clay, jar of clays. And in the, in the Middle East, you have all the clay pots, and he puts things in it. And here Paul likens us. This is just a clay pot. Right? This flesh is weak, not worth much. You, you know, you cremate it, it comes down to just a, a little bit of ash. Yet in this, it contains the power of God. Think about that. The same power that rose Christ from the dead dwells in you. If you are a believer, accepted Christ, now the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. God, in you. Think about that. The creator of the universe now dwells in this jar of clay. And why does he choose to do it this way? So that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. And in here he goes on and talks about, look, what's going to happen? We're hard pressed on every side and yet not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted but not forsaken, struck down and not destroyed. How in the world can we do all these things? It's not because the clay pot is so strong. It's because of what's in it. You know what? I don't give up hope. Why? If it's on myself, I'd be lost. Ay, ay, ay. Without the Lord, I don't know what I would do. Turn on the news. You feel that way? But the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The power of God contains in you so that when we are pressed, we don't collapse under the pressure because the Lord strengthens us from the inside out. When the world's in despair, we have the peace of the Lord in our hearts. Amen. A peace that passes understanding. Struck down, persecuted, we don't give up. Why? Not because of us, but because who now dwells in us? The kingdom of God. In a small little container. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that verse is often used in, hey, you know what, I'm going to go do what I want. That's not what the verse is talking about. Right. Isn't that you have the freedom to do whatever you want? In here, what it talks about, you have the power of God within you to do what God asked you to do. You can do it. If God has asked you to do something, he will give you the power to do it. And not just parting seas and multiplying fish, but miraculously forgive. Those that have hurt you. To miraculously pick up the broken parts of our lives and press on and not be who I used to be. To be transformed. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 
to allow the power of God in my life to change me from the inside out. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, i got to apologize for the next slide, because some of you are not going to get it. Some of you are going to say, what? But I was thinking through this. That we are just jars of clay, earthen vessels, with a mighty God in us. And I kept coming back to this idea that we are bigger on the inside than on the outside. Now, I don't know if anyone knows what this is. This is the old sci-fi flick. And the big line is, there's a, use this as a spacecraft, but it's that it's bigger on the inside than the outside. So I apologize for anyone who doesn't get this. But we have the power of God in our lives. That I'm just a mustard seed, but through faith in a mighty God, he dwells and grows and fills us. Talk about the idea of the mustard seed. Down. It starts off small and it grows. But also, in here, it turns around and becomes a blessing. That the kingdom, here, we talk about the kingdom of God being like this. He talks about the birds coming and nesting in it. That we are a blessing to those around us. God told Abraham, He said, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we see that being played out today. There's a gentleman in town I was talking to, and he goes, I'm not a Christian. He goes, but I love having Christian neighbors. <laughs> he goes, I love having Christians around me. Because it's different. He's blessed. I believe this country, God has blessed because we are built upon the principles. Now, we're not a Christian nation. Not everyone here has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. But look, by following biblical principles, whether or not you're a Christian or not. You know, the Bible says, look, uh, a man shall leave and cleave to his wife. And in here, by working that and raising children, right? The family is God's design. Now, if you're an unsaved, guess what? That still design still works. It's the best way to raise a kid. With the mom and the dad. Is it any wonder that Satan's trying to destroy that today? But in here, by us, and I, I think for so long God has been blessing this country, and I think we're turning, turning our back upon these principles. But in here, the gospel goes out, and in your lives are changed. And in, Jesus says, Look, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The call of God in the people's lives changes them. We're in a Bible school in upstate New York. And we're up in Rochester, and uh, we're involved in one of the jails there. And uh, because of funding and things, they were talking about trying to get, canceling, allowing uh, pastors to come into the jails. And so uh, one of the state representatives, uh, a very liberal man, uh, headed up a dinner. And he called all the pastors around New York to go to Albany for this pastor's dinner. And, and so I went, and... Uh, and the guy stood up, and he was honest. He goes, look, I'm not a believer. I don't pretend to be a believer. He goes, but we got to fight to keep you guys in there because what you're doing is working. You are changing people's lives. Here was an unsaved gentleman realizing that us going in with the gospel was changing people. Now, it wasn't us. It was the power of God changing people. But an unsaved person realized what a blessing it was. As we stand for him. And some of you are in that position. Because of your walk, your families have been blessed. Keep it up. Matthew 33, uh, 13, 33 is a second parable. It's just one line. And it carries a lot of these same ideas. It says, another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leaven. He talks about the idea of something small 
a little bit of yeast thrown in a whole lot of flour. And actually, I had to look up because I had no idea what three, bu uh, three measures of meal. And I looked that up, and it talks about it was 1.25 bushels, which I have no idea what a bushel is. So I had to break that down, and it roughly breaks out to about 40 to 50 pounds of flour, which is enough to make like 150 loaves of bread, which would be, give me a stick of butter, and I can make an afternoon of it. Okay, it's two sticks of butter. Fresh out of the oven? Ooh. All right. We got food after this. I got to move along. But it talks about just a little bit of leaven. And in here, what Jesus brings home is all the points we talked about before. Something small becoming great. In here is a blessing, right? You make that much bread, you've got to bless a whole lot of people. Someone dropped off a loaf of bread. I, I love homemade bread. And someone dropped off a loaf of bread. And uh, like I said, a stick of butter and a loaf of bread, warm out of the oven. I'm a happy boy. And people are blessed. But in here, the idea of using leaven has the idea of influence. That we are called to be an influence in this world. Matthew 5, Jesus talks about this. As you are the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Folks, we are called to be an influence. Let your light so shine. Be salty salt. And folks, if we're just like the world, we will make no difference. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That in here, we need to be an impact. And I think over what Mark shared on Men's Breakfast, I think the church, we've lost some of that. And we need to take a stand, and we need to show, say this is right. To shine and make a difference in this world. That in here, the parable of the mustard and, and with the leaven talks about the power of the small. But placed in God's hands, it becomes much. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and encourage us and strengthen us by it. Lord, I am small and insignificant. And Lord, all I can do is give you all of me. But Lord, you can take that and use it for your glory. Lord, help this jar of clay share the mighty power of God all around us. We ask this your name. Amen.